Today we're creating a funky fresh combat encounter which wears a leather jacket, rides a motorcycle and follows its own rules. All of this is centered around a capture the flag style game where the party are required to fill and transport five mugs of beer to their designated beer barrel before the enemy team does the same of course. But there's much more to it than just that. For context we made this unique combat encounter as part of a brewery guild initiation quest. The creation process for which is explained in its own video and isn't necessary to have seen. For this video though, we're going to discuss the steps we went through to go from just thinking combat would be cool for this quest to making a robust and sunglasses adorned encounter the whole party can both admire and do. Wink. Before we get into what we'd eventually get to, we went through a couple ideas, such as a regular combat or even an obstacle course. They want like adventurers who are hardy and strong so that they know are gonna be able to travel from town to town. So there could be like a small combat aspect to it, or maybe like an obstacle course that we could create. That could be fun to, to do an obstacle course. I've never created one of those before. While an obstacle course could have been as wiggity wild as my pronunciation of it, it didn't really make sense in the context of brewery guild trials. So reframing the entire encounter to be highly influenced and in line with the idea that this is a trial, the monastic brewery are putting the prospective initiates through would consistently be guiding our decisions. And so our first pivot would be to a tavern brawl. Something that could be really fun to do is it's a tavern fight. We'll make a tavern brawl map, like a specifically for a tavern brawl. And although it's gonna be like a fist fight, I think we can actually put a bunch of like improvised weapons around, whether it's like bottles or like broken chairs or any of these sort of things. Um, and the party can, like the player can get into this fight and it's sort of like up to them, to, you know, to utilize the resources around them. So even though it starts as just this, they can pick up all these different sort of improvised weapons and attack with them. And maybe we can create a little table that's like, this weapon is like 1d4 damage and this weapon is like 1d6 damage and stuff like that. Um, and I also think we can set it in a location where you know, the other party members, maybe they have spells or whatever, like they're able to sort of influence it. But I very much think this is like a 1v1. This first foray into devising a combat provided us some greater starting blocks, but there was two issues here. The first is that even though only one person is really meant to get into the guild, having a 1v1 encounter may be a little boring for the other party members, especially since the chosen initiate has already done some solo trials before this. And I'll say this right now, later in the piece, we decided to make this an alcohol-based fight the whole family can participate in. Other issue is that so far, this is a straight good old fisticuffs fight with improvised weapons. This occurring during a trial for a brewery guild doesn't narratively make a ton of sense. Although being able to hold one's own in a tavern is a valuable skill, the brewery guild isn't looking for straight up fighters. So off the back of Ruin Mirage's suggestion, we'd reorient the combat to be something way more interesting. I think they should have to secure a certain amount of ale at the end rather than a straight up fight. Ooh, I like that. Like it's a capture the flag type situation or like that game where there's like a bunch of balls, whatever, or like hacky sacks or whatever around the map. And you have like a hula hoop and your team, you like you run and pick one up and put it in your hoop and, and so on and so forth. I think that's good. Yeah, rather than a straight up fight, we can do like a bit more of a dynamic combat, which has has another element like that to it. This was getting us closer to something really awesome, but being the fool I am, I'd forget the central tenant we needed to follow, make this brewery guild related. Chat would recognize my numpty brain and would put us back into the beverage mentality. Five orbs around the map, and the per person needs to collect the five orbs. They need to then put at least three of their orbs into the circles. First person to three wins. You can only carry one orb at a time and you're allowed to steal from the other person's circle. I think find the signature barrel mug, fill it, we tap, take it back to the circle and defend it. Keep liquid in it for a certain number of turns. Okay, yeah, yes. Okay, I think that's getting closer. I think we can still iterate on that a bit, but I think that's like really good. Pouring a crispy cold one at the top located in the center of the encounter, then carrying the full mug back to the designated beer circle had the right theming and was a good central goal. However, we still needed to figure out some of the associated rules. The person needs to fill up three mugs and bring them to their circle. Once they're in the circle, I think they're protected. You can't take another person's drink from their circle. You can't knock them over, anything like that. While you are running, while you are holding it, your movement speed is halved. 
If you are attacked while holding a full mug of beer, of special monastic brew, um, you need to make a dexterity save of 14, we'll say, to see if you're able to continue holding the liquid. Yeah, I think the idea of like having them fill the tap was much better than orbs. Orbs? What am I saying? Am I a Looney Tune? And also let's get these, let's get these special magical things off the map. They don't, they don't relate to it at all. Let's get a barrel. What am I not? Obviously it's a barrel. What am I doing? I'm crazy. Yeah, they need to put their three drinks on the respective barrels. There we go. We're refining it down to be more monastic brewery associated. A quick side note, when I make these game-like encounters, I have some rules, but I also allow the players and their characters to really influence how the game works. Sounds like a fun thing if the classes and races would affect it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. This is one of the situations where it's like, I think it's fun to create this scenario and then the players will just like, have it be affected by the skills that they have or whatever. Right? And it's like somebody's gonna have Misty Step and be like, ah, oh, if I Misty Step, do I manage to keep the liquid in the cup? And you could be like, yes, but maybe you have to make a dexterity save to do that. Allowing players' character skills and abilities to still be relevant, I think is really important in these situations, both to keep players happy, but it also expands the unique encounters mechanics to be bigger and better than you originally anticipated. Not being precious with the mechanics or intended play style, letting the players push the boundaries of the game and allowing the crazy additions the party ask for to become aspects of the battle, make these invented encounters much more fun than forcing the players to do it exactly how you envisioned. You know, like all D&D. We had a good basis at this point, but there were still many specific rules we needed to figure out, such as the filling cup and cup delivery process. They put it on the barrel and then have to skull the drink. And then they put the empty drink down. And we'll say that drinking the drink takes a turn. Like it's just a full action they, to do it. Maybe we can have a roll associated with it, but I think they can just be at the barrel. It takes a full action to drink. So that means like there is time for others to move and stuff. I've laid out a few more rules along these lines, such as filling the drink originally takes an action. You can use an action to protect your mug, which gives you better defense against attacks. Or conversely, if you take the dash action, you need to make a deck save to avoid you being a clumsy Kelly and spilling your drink everywhere. This is a reference to my friend Kelly, who was a very clumsy silly Billy and is known to spill their drink. Let's momentarily put the brakes on this jokes train so we can get serious for a minute. Creating more specific situational rules that don't have a standard D&D counterpart is a really fine balance. Adding them can make the encounter a lot better because there's greater optionality, which can lead to higher level and more nuanced gameplay. However, if you add too many, then it becomes too complicated. Players will, entirely reasonably, forget key pieces of information and your conceptually super awesome homebrew encounter becomes practically a confusing mess. There's three main principles I follow when creating these encounters. The first is to try to only have rules exist when required slash just make sense. If the player is caressing a full mug of beer, to me, it makes sense that their movement speed would be slower. More so, to me, it doesn't make sense that scampering across a raucous tavern at full speed would be easy peasy penalty free. So we need to create a rule for that. Principle two is to make these rules simple and intuitive. When holding the mug, your movement speed is half. To fill the entire mug from the tap is an action. Rolling to keep your name from changing to Clumsy Kelly and your drink from spilling after you are hit is a deck save. The players need to learn a bunch of rules basically instantly, so we want them to make as much sense as possible. The third principle is lean on D&D mechanics as much as you can. Determining whether you get hit or not is still your AC. The action economy is the exact same. Action, bonus action, free action, movement. How far our player can move is based on their character's movement speed. While we did spawn certain unique mechanics, we didn't need to reinvent the wheel for everything. There's no new skills or stats in general, everything is based off a concept the players are familiar with. This brings us to something which actually would work a little differently, weapon damage. Okay, so instead of doing damage, I think if you hit, like certain weapons when they hit you, they require a higher dex save to keep your monk. So if you hit with like, you know, maybe a bottle, it, it like hit, like knocks you over, but because it's thrown, it's not as much as if someone like straight up runs up and like smashes you with like a stick. Like a stick is gonna be a much higher dexterity save to keep it. And I think maybe that's how we can do the different the different weapons. As far as deciding which items we'd place on the map, we'd lean on a combination of scrolling through the stamps Incarnate has and seeing what would work in a tavern setting. I don't necessarily want to do too many, 
But on the other hand, I just want to do so fucking many. I want to do so, so many. I think it would be so funny to have just like a really long list of stuff uh, that they could do. That would be very diverse. Ooh, bones? That's probably a bit hectic. That's... Bones is probably actually a bit hectic. Turkey legs, fish or eggs or other food? Ooh, yeah, we could definitely have some food on the map. Yeah, I think food. Because it's like, what we're going to do is we'll have like different deck saves and we'll just like put them in different categories. So like we'll have a bunch of stuff that's like lower. So then we can have like mugs, food, plates, like all the stuff that there's a lot of them and it's like pretty prolific. They can all be in the same tier. Despite saying I would like a long list, I would be pretty purposeful in keeping the list simple and grouping certain items together, just so there's less stats for the party to keep track of. When creating the actual table though, we needed to figure out what stats would be tracked and what values they would have. We went with hit DC, deck save, whether it's a throne or melee weapon or both. Then we also added if having the weapon adds any defensive bonus, specifically extra AC. I think all of this is pretty easy to follow while all being necessary or in the AC bonuses case adds a little bit of extra dimensionality. I should note, I would tweak these values on how they operate later. Instead of having specific hit DC for each weapon, we'd have the DC be placed on the player's dex modifier plus their proficiency bonus, or their strength modifier plus their proficiency bonus. Or in some case, it could be either of the two, or neither. This way, the player's skills are still relevant in the battle, and this encourages players to gravitate towards weapons they are better at wielding, which resembles actual combat. As far as these weapons go, I wanted to break them into two camps commonly found weapons such as mugs and food and unique weapons which are stronger but there's only one of them on the map. This also creates a situation where finding and using better weapons becomes a point of strategy for the game. This would be items like the fire poker which for three turns after being taken out of the fireplace is scalding hot and requires a really high deck save when hit by it before it cools down and becomes an average weapon. Or the moose head which takes an action to rip off the wall but provides great defensive bonuses and is pretty strong offensively as well. Well, well, the moose head can give an inspiration point when you pick it up. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's so funny. That's great. Moving from offense to not offense, defense would be pretty simple. Whether you were hit or not is determined by your AC. However, as protecting the mug carrier is an aspect of this game, I wanted to add onto this. Say there's like two people on the map, so there's like someone here, and we'll, we'll get something to represent it. Yeah, this person, perfect. But this person can be like our blocker, and this dead body can be, can be our runner. Perfect, amazing. So say like this person has a mug and is like making their way over here. I think you could maybe take a block action to be able to defend away from attacks. And I think it would make sense to be able to block, I guess an infinite amount of times. Cause that way like you could have some people just doing the movement or running back and forth. Then you can have some people who are like disruptors who are like purposely trying to fuck up other people's day. And then you have, you know, your tanks being in the way. So I think when it comes to blocking, what we can do is if you have the block action, you're able to maneuver yourself in between uh, the attack, especially thrown attacks and the party. And it then becomes your AC, which is the defining factor rather than the person, this person's AC. And if they manage to beat your uh, AC as the blocker then like if they beat that then they hit this person. The movement of the blocker is then tied to the movement of the person they're blocking for so they instead move on the mug carrier's turn instead of their own assuming that they still have some movement left on their turn. As in you can't use all your movement to get to the mug carrier then move more than that during their turn. More so the blocker is only able to block the squares of one side plus above and below the mug carrier meaning that a few squares on the back will be vulnerable. So this means having double blockers might be the play or if there's one blocker then flanking is required. To both make the block action make more sense and to add more realistic impediment on the mug carrier, all actions against the mug carrier have advantage. I've since refined various elements of this combat, but this encapsulates the essence of it as well as the process of how we went from a one-on-one -on -one tavern brawl to a mug carrying capture the flag style game for the whole party. I think it's fairly simple and pulls from D&D and other games that the party should be able to learn it quick enough that they can enjoy the actual combat while still being kind of complexed with nuanced mechanics 
mechanics and situations that mean strategy and smart approaches will be heavily rewarded. And overall, I'm really excited to break out and bust down this encounter with my party. I was talking to them about it and they were really keen to expedite the campaign to get to this quest, which is super validating. And that's the video. The write-up of the rules and the mechanics for this encounter, along with the maps are available both on the Etsy store or you can join us on the Patreon to support the channel and get access to all the maps and modules I've ever created. We made all this live on Twitch. Subscribe to the channel for more D&D content creation. Thanks for watching and as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye.